Good morning. Well, I am once again so very thankful to be here, to be part of what God is doing at Lakeside. And the coolest thing in the world is that God is faithful and that God is unchanging and that he is going to continue his good work, not only through Lakeside, but, but throughout churches around the world. And I know that God will continue his work here because God began a good work and he said, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. The work here is not completed. Not everyone in Kiwani County knows Jesus as their Savior and Lord. So the work's not done. And I know that God will faithfully carry out his work through his church. Um, this church doesn't belong to any person, although we're all a part of it. This church is God's church, and he is going to carry out his mission through his church because he is an awesome and loving God. This morning, um, we have an awesome opportunity to continue in our series called Joy Unstoppable. Um, but as we launch in, I was thinking, um, you know, right where we're at, We've been, we've been talking a lot about the character and nature of God and that our joy is anchored and rooted into who he is and what he is doing. But now we're getting to a passage that says, you know what, now that you know these truths, live that way. Live it. It's one thing to say, oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for being faithful. Thank you for being unchanging. Thank you for being perfect that we can place our hope in you and that we can have joy unstoppable because our joy is not found in our circumstances. Our joy is found in you. And, and now Paul goes on to say, okay, if those are realities in your life, let that shape the way you live. And so my prayer today is that we would begin to have a heavy dose today of applying this to our daily lives living out of this joy. And honestly, this is difficult because when you pursue living out of the joy of Jesus, um, there's a spiritual battle that happens and grumbling sets in. And Paul is well aware that grumbling sets in. And so he addresses that in today's passage. But before we get to today's passage, uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16, and 17 says, All scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God or man or woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So God's word that we're going to look at today is good for all that. It's good for causing us to live the way that we should live and equipping us for the good work God is calling us to. So with that said, we're going to look at Ephesians, uh, or not Ephesians. We're in Philippians today, right? <laughs> we're in Philippians. Philippians 2, uh, verses 12 through 18, and it says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work, for his good pleasure. We're going to stop there and just kind of focus on these two verses before we take on the next verses. Um, look at this. First of all, he says, Therefore, my beloved... My dearly loved ones. Paul is saying, you know what? Church in Philippi, I love you guys. You guys are family. And I feel the same way about you guys. You guys are my dear family. I know we've only been together for about five months. And it has gone by like that. Uh, my plan was to be here until uh, your new pastor came. But God had a different plan. And isn't that weird? We have our plans. We set our plans. 
and God has a plan that we don't understand. And at the moment, it doesn't even seem to make sense. But God has a plan, and he's going to carry out his plan through us. But Paul says, okay, church in Philippi, you are my dearly loved kids. I love you like my own kids. Paul didn't have kids because he wasn't married. So these churches that he planted were kind of like his offspring, his spiritual offspring. And he's saying, you are dearly loved. And he goes on to say, uh, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence. Um, can, and then he goes on to say this really weird phrase, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And he continues on to say, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Which actually causes me to go, okay, Paul, what's going on here? Because either I'm working out my salvation or God's working it out. We can't both be working this out. Like, that doesn't make sense. And I'm going, okay, Paul, in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, you said that it is by grace we have been saved through faith. So now you're telling us to work out our salvation? Like, Something's not lining up. The reality here is that when he says that we are to work out our salvation, it's, a, it's an already realized salvation. Salvation is, has already happened for the church in, for the believers in Philippi. He's saying, work out that salvation in your everyday life. What that means is that the salvation is a done deal. They are justified. They are set free from their sin. But he is hoping that they realize the depth of their salvation as they grow in Christ. He's hoping that they get a full picture of what salvation means. Now, I came to know Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord when I was six. That was a few years ago. And when I was six, I was fully saved by the grace of God. But did I understand what I was fully saved from? Absolutely not. I am still learning today how desperately in need of a Savior I am. And so the salvation is a constant thing. We are not to work. He doesn't say earn your salvation. He says, okay, this is an already realized reality. You are saved. Now work out what that means. What does that mean to be saved? And that is the process of sanctification. But then he goes on in verse 13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So God gives us the will to seek him and he draws us to himself so that we might have a tight-knit relationship with him. Timothy Keller um, has this quote. He says, the gospel is not just the ABCs of, of the Christian life, but the A to Z of the Christian life. That's another way to kind of say the same idea, that we're working out our salvation. We are saved when we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord. We are saved from our sin, but we don't fully understand it. Believe me, God fully understands what we're saved from. He's all-knowing. We're coming along slowly. So we're the ones, as we go through this Christian life, we're going, whoa, I did not realize how saved I am. And every time we encounter the struggles and sins and temptations, we battle, and we realize that God's grace is available to us, that radically changes the way we live life. So uh, Tim Keller says that, you know, that the gospel, that the gospel of our salvation is not just the ABCs, but it is the A through Z of the Christian life. Another uh, theologian and author goes on, uh, John Piper goes on to say, you never, 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 did you get that? <laughs> um, outgrow, <laughs> outgrow your need for this gospel. You don't begin the Christian life with this and then leave it behind to get stronger with something else. God strengthens, strengthens us 
with the gospel till the day we die. So it's not like God saves us by his grace and then says, okay, now you got to figure it out. He says, the same gospel that saves us is the same gospel that sanctifies us and makes us new. And Paul is wanting this church in Philippi to go, okay, I know you're saved, but you don't realize how saved you are. You do not get how saved you are. And Paul is saying, work out your salvation. And the fear and trembling, when you realize how sinful you are and how holy God is, does that cause us to fear and tremble at the power of God? He could squash us like a grape and be totally justified. But he doesn't. He chooses to be slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, as Psalm 150, or 145 says, that we are dearly loved because of the grace of God. We're loved because God is love. And this reality that we never outgrow our need for the gospel couldn't be more true today than any other day in our life. So the reality is that Paul is wanting this church to realize the grace of God in an ongoing way. He's wanting them to say, you know what? I am so dearly loved by God that that produces a joy in me. That produces something in me that I cannot produce on my own strength. The next uh, group of verses goes on to say, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Okay, we can just stop right there. Um, <laughs> I've started to get to know some of you, and the reality of doing all, all things without grumbling or disputing that's not a reality. But Paul is encouraging this church in Philippi to be marked as a group of people that don't grumble and don't have disputes among one another. Now, this past Thursday and Friday, I had the privilege of teaching summer school. And I was uh, teaching third graders, and many of them I've known since they were in first grade. They're the essence of grumbling and disputing. <laughs> if, if you could just journey with me for a minute, they would show up and they would stand in line as we got our day started. I would stand at the front and every kid wanted to be the first kid in line. And they would grumble when they couldn't be the first person in line because that was their expectation. That was their hope. That was what they put their... Uh, desire towards was to be first in line. And so every kid wanted to be first in line. So that's how we start our day. They're grumbling and complaining and arguing among each other who's going to be first. And then we go down to the room and we're um, getting the kids get breakfast down in the cafeteria and they're arguing about who gets the chocolate milk because maybe there's only one left. And they're arguing about that. And then we get to the classroom, and they're arguing about the color of markers they get to use or what so-and-so said to me in the hallway or whatever. They're grumbling, 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 grumbling. And this word disputing is actually just competitive grumbling um, <laughs> is what it amounts to. It's like, you know what? We grumble. Disputing just is competitive grumbling. That's what it comes down to. So when you grumble and someone else is grumbling, you want your grumbling to be louder or, or worse or like more profound. And so you grumble, and then there's this dispute, like who's, who's grumbling is worse. And Paul is saying, I don't want you guys to be marked as a church that is about grumbling and disputing. I don't want you to be focused on that. It's easy to be focused on our circumstances, and honestly, we're no different than my third graders. When we don't get what we want, we grumble. Now, maybe as adults, we've learned this tactic of just grumbling inwardly, putting on a good show outside. Everyone thinks you're fine, but deep down inside, you're grumbling. The third graders just let it all out, you know? Um, <laughs> But the reality for those of us that are adults, we've kind of refined that where, you know, I'm fine. 
but deep inside we're grumbling. And if someone were to just let us grumble, give us that out to like share our our struggle, we'll we'll share it. <laughs> and and they'll be the recipient of that. And then they might start grumbling about their circumstances. And Paul said, you know, even if you're not third graders, even if you're adults, we still grumble and we still get into disputes among one another. He doesn't want that for the church in Philippi. And he goes on in verse 15 to say, uh, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as, as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. So Paul, here's what he's doing. This is brilliant. Paul is awesome. He's saying, okay, I know your tendency is to grumble and then take that to a competitive level. I understand that that's how you, just in your flesh, that's how you're going to live. Your identity is not tied to your circumstances. He's saying, you know what? I'm going to remind you, church in Philippi, and I'm going to remind you, church of Lakeside, that our identity is forever changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Who we are is forever changed because of what Jesus did. Look at the, look at the language here. That you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish. How does that happen? That can only happen one way. The death, life, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And his perfection exchanged for our imperfection can cause us to live as blameless and innocent children of God without blemish. Apart from Christ, we have blemishes. With Christ, the exchanged life, us exchanging our sinful nature for his holy nature, we are cleansed from all unrighteousness. That's how that happened. So Paul is saying, you know what? Don't be a grumbler. Take on your identity as who you are in Christ. That's why he wants them to work out their salvation. He's saying, you guys don't realize how saved you are. I want you to understand how saved you are so that you begin living out of your Christ-like identity and that, sh that shapes how you go through your everyday life. And he, he says in verse 16, hold fast to the word of life. Hold fast to the word of life. The word of life here refers to Jesus, who is the living word of life. Um, this word, word, logos, it means, it means the living word of God, the Bible, as well as Jesus. So Jesus is our living word. And he says here, hold fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. So did Paul exert effort for the sake and for the goodness of the church of Philippi? He did. He exerted all kinds of effort. He endured struggles and temptations. He endured suffering. And Paul is crazy because he actually considers his suffering joy. And my hope and prayer is that every one of us in this room gets to the point where Paul is at, where we look at our suffering and go, I count this as joy, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to suffer for your name. Because that's where Paul gets to. Now, many of us, we find great joy when things go our way. And Paul is saying, even when things don't go my way, I'm going to find joy because my joy is inextricably tied to the one who is unchanging, to the one who will never fail me. And that's what I'm hoping for all of us, myself included, is that we live this brand new, this, this way. And that we would shine, as it says in here, shine as lights in the world. We live in a dark world. I don't, I, I don't need to tell you that. Just watch uh, Fox News, CNN, 
just turn that on for a day and just sit in front of your TV for like eight hours, you will be depressed. You will be depressed by the darkness and depravity of our world. And the news loves to report it. The reality, though, is we live in a dark world, but in the darkness, we are to shine as lights. We are to shine as reflectors into this world, reflecting the character and nature of who God is so that people see him, not us. It's not about us. It's about him and his glory. And Paul is saying, you know what? He says, hold fast to the word of life so that, in, so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Paul wants to say, you know what? I want my work to have purpose. I want my work to fulfill what God desires in you. So work out your salvation. Realize how saved you are. Don't grumble and complain, but live as people that are marked by what Jesus has done for you. Live with a gospel identity intact as you go through whatever circumstances you encounter. Paul goes on to say, even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you should also be glad, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. Okay, so for a while, I was a volleyball coach. And there, you, know, you try to come up with these inspiring coach talks before a, a match where you're like, they're just going to leave it all out on the court. They're just going to, every ounce of effort is going to be pour, poured forth for us to win this match. And sometimes that would happen, and other times it wouldn't. Paul is saying that he is being poured out as a drink offering. He is leaving it out on the court. There's no energy left in him. We need to remember that he's in a Roman prison at this point as he's writing, and he's saying, you know what? I'm being poured out. There is less and less of me and more of Jesus in my life, and I am poured out to the point where I am almost non-existent anymore. As we get older, our bodies get more frail, we get weaker, and you would think that would not be a good thing for the gospel. But Paul is saying, as he is living his life, as he is spent for the sake of Christ, it is a good thing, and he's rejoicing in that. He's saying, you know what? I'm tired. He's coming to the end of his ministry days, and he's saying, I'm tired, but it's a good tired. I am so wiped out. Now, there's a good tired, and there's a bad tired, when you're tired and then your kids are still making noise at 11 o'clock at night and you want to go to bed, that's probably a bad tired. But when you've worked hard and you've accomplished a task with a group of friends and you've finished a project and you go to bed and you're laying in bed at night and you barely can keep your eyes awake, eyes, eyes open because you're drifting off to sleep, sleep so quickly, um, that's a good tired. You're like, my life was spent on something purposeful today. And Paul is saying, I don't want to count my life as laboring or working in vain. I'm, I'm hoping that what my work has done in Philippi is producing what God desired, is producing a work that only could happen by the grace of God. I love at the end of verse 17 where he says, I am glad and rejoice with you all. He's rejoicing with the church of Philippi in what he's hearing happening in that church. But he goes on to say, likewise, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. Earlier, we saw that they were partakers of God's grace together. And now he's saying, as the church in Philippi, I want you to have great joy. I want you to rejoice, which means have double joy. Have joy again. Rejoice. So you're rejoicing with me. And they're rejoicing with Paul pouring out his life. Paul is hoping that as he pours out his life, that that becomes contagious. That people are in the church in Philippi are pouring out their lives for the sake of others. 
that they're not living for themselves. They're not living for their own wants, their own needs, their own desires. Because if you live for your own wants, your own needs, and your own desires, what that leads to is grumbling. And then competitive grumbling, like I said. Um, we don't need to go down that path. We can go down a different path. And Paul is laying it out very clearly that that path comes when we slow down and when, it, when we realize life is not about us, we have a brand new identity in Christ. We have a gospel-rooted identity because of what Jesus has done for us. We are holy and blameless. The only way we can be holy and blameless is because of Jesus. And as we go, wow, I, I am so saved and I'm realizing the joy that I have in Jesus, that joy becomes t contagious. And we can replace grumbling with joy. We can even replace what looks like suffering with joy. We can say, you know what? We can trade suffering and, and exchange that for joy. We can honestly look at life and say, you know what? The greatest struggles in my life in the end, when I cling on to Jesus, produce joy. My wife and I have gone through so very many struggles in our life and in our marriage and all of this, there, there's chaos all around us. And if I look at where I have grown in my ability to have Christ-rooted joy, it's when the, the false idols that I have been placing my joy in get stripped away. And all that's left is Jesus. So I'm praying a dangerous prayer and have been praying a dangerous prayer for all of you that your lives get wrecked by the grace of God in a very powerful way where if there is anything you're putting your hope in, if you're saying, you know what, I'm going to put my hope in a perfect job. Newsflash, there's no perfect job. But there is a perfect Jesus. If you're saying, you know what, I can't wait to get that new car. I'm going to work so hard, and I'm going to get this perfect new car. Newsflash, cars aren't perfect. It will fail you at some point. Maybe you're, maybe you're a mom, and you're like, oh, I'm going to produce the perfect child. <laughs> um, maybe they're going to live the life that I always dreamed I could have had. Newsflash. Children are not perfect, but Jesus is. Maybe, you know, maybe, maybe it's something else. Maybe you're tying your hope to something else. But I guarantee you, if you tie your hope to anything other than Jesus Christ, it will fail you. And I hope that at that point, when life fails you or what you put your hope in fails you, I hope that right at that point, you see that's where Jesus wants to meet you. So when life feels like it's falling apart, there should be a little grin of joy on your face because you're like, okay, Lord, what are you doing? You're doing something here to produce joy within me. You're doing something to undo me so that I am remade into the image of Christ. You're stripping away what is false to put within me what is true. This coming week, you have the opportunity to join small groups throughout this coming week, and they're going to be reflecting on some questions. I'm going to just run these uh, through real briefly. We don't have time to discuss them this morning, but we do have time over this coming week uh, to discuss these questions and more. Uh, the first question, what does it look like to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling? That's just, what does that look like in your everyday life? How are you currently working out your salvation? Secondly, what is God currently doing in your life? It may look like a struggle or a point of suffering, but God may be doing a work right there. And even this morning, you might be sitting here with something heavy on your heart. And the reality is that thing that is heavy in your heart you may be putting your hope in something that is false, a false god, a false idol. And this morning, 
might be that morning of reckoning where you're coming to God and saying, God, I am done putting my hope in things that will fail me. I am going to put my hope in you and in you alone. Uh, number three, what causes you to grumble? When you ask that question, all of a sudden there's going to be idols that are going to become evident in your mind where you're going to go, okay, I am grumbling because, and, and you can fill in the blank, and that will help you unpack, and the Holy Spirit hopefully will reveal to you, why are you grumbling? Because when we live in light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we don't have a reason to grumble. And lastly, how are you shining as blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation? Don't get sucked in by the crooked and twisted generation. Live differently. I want to encourage you to see that because of Jesus, you are shining. You, are, you have the opportunity to shine as blameless and innocent children of God without blemish. And people could see Jesus in you because of that. So my charge to you today is to go and live that way. Because this world desperately needs to know the love of Jesus Christ. This world is so very messed up. And many of us get sucked into it on a daily basis. But look at this quote, um, and I'm going to just end this morning with this. It says, To be loved and not known is comforting but superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved is, well, a, light, a lot like being loved by God. It is what we need more than anything. It liberates us from pretense, humbles us out of self-righteousness, and fortifies us for any difficulty life can throw at us. I want to encourage you. You are going to encounter difficulties. Life is going to throw difficulties at you. When that happens, hold on to the word of life. Hold on to Jesus and let him lead and guide you. Let him turn your suffering into joy. Let him turn whatever it is that you're clinging to hope for, let him turn that aside so that you put your hope in him and in him, him alone. For those of you that are here this morning that don't yet know Christ, my hope and prayer is that this morning would be the morning of your salvation. This morning would be the time where you say, you know what, I am done trying to live my life on my own strength. I am surrendering my life to the will of Jesus. So maybe Jesus is drawing you this morning to start that walk with him, to start that relationship with him. And for those of us that have been walking with Jesus for a long time, maybe God has used this morning to reveal to you why you grumble. Or maybe you're looking at your life and you're like, I don't feel like an innocent and blameless child of God walking in this messed up world. I feel messed up. My hope in prayer is that your identity would be rooted to who you are in Christ and that you begin to live and shine, that this whole community would know that there is a Jesus who loves them, that there is a Jesus who is alive and well and living and working in and through his church. So pray with me. Dear Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you, first of all, are with us right now. Lord, that you are speaking to our hearts. Lord, continue the work that you have begun. And Lord, we know that you will because you are faithful and you say you will continue your work. Lord, I thank you for this Lakeside Church family uh, that is so dearly uh, loved, not only by you, but by me. Lord, I thank you uh, for the love that I have felt from so many in this congregation, the encouragement uh, that I have walked away with. Uh, Lord, I thank you uh, for the countless meetings I've been able to go to, and Lord, just for the work that I see you doing. There is evidence of your grace all over this church. And Lord, I pray that that would continue to happen. And Lord, I do pray that you would lead 
the right pastor here at the exact right moment. And Lord, we do trust you for that. And we pray all of this in your mighty and holy name. Amen.